Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. Report. Re, 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 report. Yes, Ding Dong, the witch is dead. Warren Buffett, the extortionist private equity nut job, is uh, reported uh, game changing, record breaking losses as Berkshire Hathaway, his holding company, goes belly up, more or less. Stacy. This episode is an exercise in bad taste. Well, actually, it's an exercise in poor taste, which would be the phrase, the, the log line for pink flamingos. Uh, so I'm going to refer first to the pink flamingos because we have a tweet directed at us from one of our viewers, and his name is NZ Central, and he says, off topic, I like the flamingos in the Kaiser Report. Where are they? My wife also commented on how nice they are. So I got some pink flamingos, brought them back to the set. They're on the set. You know, they should be multiplying like they are in Mumbai because of the lockdown. All the pink flamingos are surrounding everything. Mm, discount, discount version. Right, of course, Pink Flamingos was a um, raunchy bad taste. That's fine, that's bad. fine, let it go. Okay. Of course, Pink Flamingos was a raunchy bad taste film by John Waters in 1972. And I think 1972 is an important year that we started bringing in bad art and bad taste and trashy taste because that's when we started getting trashy food and poor taste uh, sort of investors like Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett this past weekend did announce results. Not only did he lose over $50 billion in the first quarter, but he proceeded to trash the entire U.S. economy. He announced that he dumped all of his shares, the entirety of his holding, holdings in four U.S. airlines, United, American, Southwest, and Delta. He, he owned 10% of those. He dumped those. But what did he tell the ordinary person, the investors out there? I hope I've convinced you to bet on America. Warren Buffett, he's a guy who, of course, has no bet on America because he he's now piled up $137 billion. This whole Buffett thing with his dumping of the airlines, you know, let's contrast this with 2008. In 2008, when the banks were having financial difficulty because they committed massive fraud, or when a bank like Wells Fargo, which is a big Buffett holding, commits massive fraud that he condones by ripping people off in their millions of retail banking accounts. He rushes to the rescue like Florence Nightingale. How can I restructure? I'll take over as CEO as he did with um, Solomon Brothers, you know, way back when. I'll write checks. I'll be a crony capitalist. I'll go to Washington. I'll help you because you're going to buy my 0% coupon bonds. You're going to give me inside information. You're going to goose up my performance. And then in 2020, when the airlines are in trouble, which he has a big percentage ownership in, made up of blue collar workers, minimum wage workers, hardworking Americans, he's like, nah, drop dead. You know, Warren Buffett to America, drop dead. He's a backstabbing, reprehensible clown. Well, it was an exercise in poor taste. That was what we saw at the at the Berkshire Hathaway shareholder meeting. It was just him on, a, you know, a, basically a camera, one camera on his own. But the exercise in poor taste has been, you know, since he began his investing days. First of all, he plays a ukulele pretending to be a normal person, like a hillbilly and a hick, just like you out there. And what does he push on you? He's pushed uh, genetically modified stuff, uh, corn syrup laden ketchups and, and Coca-Cola. That's one of his biggest, most famous holdings, Wrigley chewing gum, all sugar, 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 corn syrup. He's made you fat, made you basically vulnerable to something like COVID-19, which is hitting uh, the obese in particular. And why are you obese? Because of his poor taste. I like he's pushed this garbage on you. And you mentioned 2008 when he bailed out Goldman Sachs and, and some of the other companies. Of course, they were the counterparties to AIG and, and the insurance and reinsurance companies that he himself owned. So he was kind of bailing out his own positions and getting the Fed to do the same. Buffett says Berkshire hasn't provided financial support to companies as it did during the 2008 financial crisis because we don't see anything that attractive. So of course, what's different about this time is the Treasury is having to step in, meaning the taxpayer's money. And it's not just uh, Fed printing more credit and you know, thus inflation. But, you know, there are basically provisos in order to, like, there's a, some clawbacks allowed inside this bailout for the airline industry. So here we have this airline industry that has received tens of billions of dollars in bailouts after, and they require these bailouts, by the way, because Warren Buffett loves 
share buybacks, which only reduces the cash on your balance sheet, makes you more vulnerable. Again, just like he made you more vulnerable by selling you Coca-Cola, he's made companies more vulnerable by convincing them to do stock buybacks. So here we have uh, the taxpayers come forward with tens of billions of dollars for airlines, and they're not allowed to do stock buybacks. So of course, that makes him throw his pink flamingo out of his pram, his you know, crack up his ukulele and pretend like he's throwing a fit and that this is some great investment advice not to buy airlines, when the fact is he's just uh, operating in poor taste and poor faith. John Waters, who made pink flamingos, he should reshoot that film and replace the role of Divine with Warren Buffett. You know, particularly the sidewalk scene with the dog would fit Warren's personality personality quite well. Uh, as far as the stock buybacks go, this is interesting because he says, oh, I'll be an investor in your company, and then he encourages these companies to do stock buybacks, which used to be illegal, but uh, now, without a doubt, it's highly dangerous to your balance sheet in case there is a crisis because you have no cash. Uh, and it's a bit of an extortion scam because in the case of IBM, IBM, he was a big player, big buyer of IBM stock, and then IBM balked at the idea of buying back their own stock, and then Warren Buffett dumped them. You know, he stabbed him in the back because unless you're going to make me money by doing what was illegal stock buybacks and immoral stock buybacks, I don't want any interest in what you're doing. So his performance, which is supposed to be this fantastic multi-decade performance, if you strip out the stock buybacks, you strip out the accounting fraud, you strip, you strip out the cozy uh, relationships in Washington and Wall Street, he's not outperforming a money market fund. Right, and in terms of this exercise in poor taste and why his investment thesis, like this guy invests in companies and basically helps destroy and undermine America through his encouragement of Fed intervention in all his financial investments, and including in the insurance sector and reinsurance sector, which by the way, apparently some of his insurance companies have not been paying out to all these small businesses that have insurance on um, you know, disruption to business. Uh, insurance, so he's not paying out on that. So he keeps on claiming. Remember, this is all about projection because anybody who keeps on claiming over and over and over, um, I'm doing this for America. I'm just investing for America, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm long America. Well, you know, as long as he, he could find a moat, like he's he encourages the moats whereby the airline industry in America can charge twice as much per mile, passenger mile, as European airlines because there's no competition. Anywhere there's no competition, there's no co competition in the banking sector because you need to have a cozy relationship with the New York Fed. And if you don't have a cozy relationship with the New York Fed, you're toast. So here I want to point out that Max tweeted a little bit of an incorrect number just by one billion, but what's one billion when you have 137 billion, right? Uh, imagine having 138 billion in cash and no Bitcoin or gold. Buffett most overrated investor ever, except for Ray Dalio. Now, Nick Zabo, who uh, many say invented Bitcoin, but he denies it, so we'll say that. But he's a you know cryptographer and an OG sort of cypherpunk, and he responds, Buffett's wealth can be measured less in present cash than in the future cash from the Fed. He is right up there at the front of the Cantillon line to get. Right, right. During the quarter, the um, money supply increased by like 18%. Right, the, the Fed was just flooding the economy with money, and a lot of those money goes through Buffett's holdings, like the banks that he owns. Yes, and he still managed to lose fifty billion. I mean, this is such an overrated clown, uh, and and his performance is horrible. When it, when you compare it to gold, he's he's not outperforming gold. Gold is outperforming Buffett. Bitcoin is up nine million percent since its inception. It's up, you know, in the last 10, 15, 20 years, it's outperforming Buffett by thousands of percentage points. Big, Berkshire Hathaway price in Bitcoin is probably near zero. And um, he has all this cash, which is not a good thing if you're supposed to be a celebrated investor, right? You're saying, I don't really know what I'm doing anymore. I stabbed America in the back. <laughs> I didn't pay out the Geico claims. I uh, didn't come to help the airline industry when they needed me most. So I just was there for the for the free cash that I was channeling and laundering through the airlines for me, Warren Buffett. You know, and now, uh, you know, y'all can just uh, jump off a bridge. I don't care. I've abandoned America. I've stabbed you in the back. And that's his legacy. On his tombstone, it'll say Warren Buffett, traitor. 
Well, I do want to say that Norway, their Norwegian uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund has gone big. They've doubled down on America. They've invested very long in this past uh, month, April. So Warren Buffett was dumping shares. They were buying. So uh, let's see who's uh, more patriotic than Warren Buffett. I also want to say Jason Ruan wrote to us on Twitter, and he said, Max, maybe Cantillionaire might be a nice new neologism for describing those closest to the free money hose. So Warren Buffett is not a multi-billionaire. Many people say, oh my God, he's a multi-billionaire. He must be amazing. No, he's a cantillionaire. He's friends with the Fed, and that's why he's a cantillionaire. Right. Bernie Madoff would, uh, and Warren Buffett are two sides of the same coin, you know, except that Bernie didn't have the right connections. He didn't have the, he wasn't on the speed dialer of Lloyd Blankfein or Jamie Dimon, so now he's sitting in jail. Warren should be also in jail for doing the exact, pretty much the exact same thing. So, you know, we started with an exercise in poor taste, and that's why we talked about Warren Buffett and his poor taste of pretending to be an ordinary person who plays a ukulele. And that's why we have the pink flamingos up here, because pink flamingos is an exercise in poor taste. Warren Buffett is an exercise in poor taste. Warren's gone. Warren's gone. And, of course, I want to say we're going to now end with an exercise in good taste, very poor smell. You don't know how difficult it's been to sit through this segment as we have this surprise here for our final headline, and that is some Morbier cheese from France up near the Comte region, Franche Comte, up near the Swiss it border. It doesn't smell bad. Oh, yeah? Take a whiff of that. This smells... Max is half French, essentially. Oh, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking, Max, with this last segment oh. of this otherwise exercise and poor taste, oh. that we could end up becoming I'm French. having a cheese gasm right now. We're talking about uh, 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 French citizenship here, basically, because we're going to be patriotic to France right now. French people are being told it's their patriotic duty to eat more cheese after sales have slumped. The dairy industry is calling on consumers to eat cheese in solidarity with our producers of Saint-Nectaire, Reblochon, Cantal, Camembert. The situation is critical and requires a rapid increase in consumption, said the president of the dairy collective, Sodial, Damien Lacombe. She, the French have their priorities straight. Cheese is the first food for humans. This is why we have such an affinity for it. This is some milk that was uh, got into the you know, carrying around in the um, stomach of a yak or a goat turned uh -huh. into cheese. And Cow. And this was the first um, food that humans ever know. That's why we love it so. So, oh, uh, it so you know, this, I can tell that the milk from this cheese was from a cow who was standing on the northwest slope of a mountain near Conte, and he had on a bell that was ringing out a, a Led Zeppelin tune. So I quickly, in the last few, 10 seconds here, so quickly I want to point out that the industry has launched a campaign to encourage French people to eat more cheese. It's called Fromage Son, which means let's act for cheese because sales of cheese have declined by 60% in France. This is the Morbier uh, cheese right here, and it's done in two, the morning milk and the afternoon milk. So it's uh, very delicious. Yeah, more cheese, more life. And um, remember that no flamingos were injured during the recording of this segment. Stay tuned for more coming your way. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to go to Craig Hemke. He is a precious metals analyst at TF Metals Report. Craig, welcome back. Always a pleasure, Max. Great to see you. Yeah, baby. We're heading toward a major change in direction for a lot of things. Now, Warren Buffett over there, Berkshire Hathaway, hates gold, hates Bitcoin even more. His fund is down $50 billion so far this year. Both gold and Bitcoin are up. The U.S. budget deficit is due to hit $4 trillion this year. Perfect conditions for gold this year and beyond, I would think. Craig, what do you think? Yeah, it sure seems that way, Max. Uh, you recall last year we thought was going to be the year of the breakout, and it was. We finally made six and seven year highs. And I thought we'd continue this year, though. I mean, who could have seen this uh, virus coming and the QE to infinity that was announced about six weeks ago? But I mean, heck, we've already hit my target for this year. I thought we'd get to maybe 1750 to 1800. We got to 1788 already in April. But I do think the conditions persist. I mean, this is just madness where we live. I mean, what they. They've announced now the Fed is buying corporate bonds. I mean, it'll be high yield next. Uh, get the Dow under 20,000, they'll start buying uh, equity ETFs just like the Bank of Japan. 
Uh, all of that obviously is conducive to, you know, at least having some part of your portfolio in the precious metals. And, you know, the other thing, Max, we don't talk about too much are the mining shares. I mean, there's, you can't really find another sector of the stock market that has expanding earnings and rising dividends. But that's what we've got in the mining shares. And so that might be some play, way that people can uh, maybe make a little extra fiat too. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, the Fed is desperate. Somebody from the Fed came by yesterday, knocked on the door looking for some old silverware that they wanted to give me a billion dollars for. I turned them down. I was sentimental value. Now, Craig, I need your insight into something here. The president of the Shanghai Gold Exchange wants a super sovereign currency for post-crisis times. So your thoughts on what this might be? Do you believe it's time for a neutral global unit of account of some type? Craig, what do you think? Man, Max, I'm sitting here thinking the first time you and I met, I think was about 2013. And we were walking around in front of the JP Morgan building in, in uh, Midtown Manhattan talking about this, you know, talking about the eventual reset, you know, that the dollar like any other currency that has been reserved currency status, eventually loses it, you know, because it's an exorbitant privilege that gets abused. And I mean, clearly it's being abused now and has been now for over a decade. I think the Chinese have that potential platform in, in place to challenge the dollar. Maybe not supplant it. Uh, you know, maybe they come out with some kind of regional currency to facilitate trade uh, in their part of the world. Who knows? But this notion that's now getting bandied about that is some kind of penalty for the coronavirus, the U.S. is going to, you know, walk away or cancel some of the, the debt that is owed to China. I mean, that's just, that's not going to fly. And if we attempt anything like that, um, that could be the start of, you know, maybe an economic World War III where the Chinese offer some kind of currency like that to, or, you know, maybe gold backing to their existing currency to give it a competitive advantage give maybe the time will come where countries will actually want a strong currency rather than this you know non-stop debasement you know race to the bottom if that comes why not back your currency at least partially with some hard assets like gold i mean there's speculation i mean the, the chinese report that they've got a couple thousand tons i think people think that's off by an order of magnitude or more and uh, if that's the case yeah uh, be, the, that will really upset the global apple cart, no doubt about it. Well, I agree with you that this tit for tat going on between China and the United States over the coronavirus and um, Secretary of State Pompeo claiming that somehow China sat on information that was available on YouTube since December. I think they should give Pompeo a YouTube account so that he can actually see what's happening in China because they had live footage of people dropping dead from the coronavirus. I don't know what he thought that was. But anyway, I'm going to deduct that from my taxes. How about that, uh, CIA? Uh, so, you know, we've talked on this show a few times about um, bullion banks being involved in scams where they're short gold. And uh, here we have news. Scotiabank has been a gold bullion bank since the 17th century. I think it's the oldest bullion bank in the world. It's closing its gold business. And... Um, they had problem delivering gold last month, apparently, for exactly what we've been warning people about for five or six years, that these banks have been selling or lending gold that they do not have. And if there was actual demand and there was a run on Scotiabank, that's what it looks like happened, they would have to close their doors. Is that, a, you think, what, ha what happened? And are we going to see a domino effect with the bullion banks? And they're all going to go out of business because they're all short gold. Craig. You know, the Scotia thing, as you said, they bought Makata, and Makata's the original bullion bank, if you will, from the 17th century. And so now, and they're getting out of the precious metals business. Kind of has a scent of a, you know, the rats fleeing the sinking ship. They're not the first uh, bullion bank to get out of that, that market. And I think a lot of it is due, they just can't make any money at it anymore. I mean, and it's just not worth the regulatory oversight and everything that comes with it. And so they're just saying, and they're just, they're just moving on. Um, that doesn't mean the system is broken just yet. There are other banks that are more than happy to take their place. Whether it was Scotch back on the 23rd and 24th of March that was in trouble, I've heard some folks say it was UBS. Either way, it was uh, a delivery default that wasn't defined that way. The, the media didn't allow it to be defined that way, and certainly the LBMA and the CME didn't allow it to be defined that way. But they've been playing these games on the COMEX and the LMA 
for well for years uh, called in the process of something you and I have discussed before called the exchange for physical where you take a Comex contract which is a hundred ounces and you transfer it off of the Comex and uh, allegedly exchange it for physical EFP in London and it was this process that the banks were just abusing uh, playing the spread between spot and futures and and thinking they could make a risk-free little profit every day and it got to the point in March, Max, where it was just outrageous what they were doing. In the first 15 trading days of March, they swapped out almost 300,000 COMEX contracts this way. And it's like 900 metric tons of gold allegedly exchanged for physical. I mean, it was a scam, right? So somebody shows up you know, on the 24th of March, right after QE to infinity was announced. You know, where every, someone's, everyone's scrambling for physical gold because uh, the refineries, the mints, and the, and the miners are all, you know, they're all starting to shut down because of COVID. So somebody shows up and says, well, hey, look, the CME does this thing here with these exchanges for physical. Let's just get some of their physical. That's, that's where we can get some. And as soon as somebody stood and actually wanted delivery, boom, the whole thing blew up because they didn't have any actual physical. Now, since then, you know, the LBMA has taken all these steps to try to claim, oh, yeah, there's all kinds of, don't worry about it. It's just in the wrong place and all this stuff. But nobody ever stops to say, well, wait a second. Where were all these 100-ounce bars you were allegedly settling, you know, for years? I mean, there's not a single one anywhere. It's all just a scam, man. The whole paper market digital derivative pricing scheme is a scam. And that is now, you know, people are starting to figure this out. And, yeah, the sooner they do, the sooner we get – an actual fair price for the precious metals. And when that day finally comes, it's not going to be whatever it is now, $1,700 an ounce. And that's kind of what we're all hoping for because the banks just ruin everything. I mean, the, it's not just the precious metals markets. They've ruined basically every market as they all, you know, they just try to bend all the rules in their favor as, to make as much money as they can. Well, listening to you describe what's going on there, it reminded me of 2008. So Wall Street banks were caught short trillions of dollars with the bonds. Yep. And so somebody had to walk the plank where they could bury all the dead bodies and that somebody was Lehman Brothers yeah. and Bear Stearns. So they all got together in a big meeting down on Wall Street. They said, we got caught with our pants down. Uh, we're short a huge amount of these bonds that we oversold, that we missold. And we're gonna have to bury it in one of you that, sitting at this table. Yeah. One, of, one, one bank was not at the table and that was Lehman Brothers. So Dick Fold and Lehman Brothers were had to walk the plank essentially and now you're saying the scotia bank had to walk the plank because all the bullion banks got together and said wait a minute we just got caught in a massive fraud scheme we got to bury all these uh, errors somewhere and it looks like scotia bank number came up all righty delivery problems with futures contracts and oil caused the price of oil to plummet to negative 37 dollars last month could delivery problems in gold cause it to soar by currently unimaginable numbers that's what we're talking about here at the end max because these banks have taken the same ounce of gold and sold it over and over and over and because rarely anybody ever takes delivery they just want to feel like they actually have gold oh you can go ahead and store it for me i don't care i just want to know that i have it well then what the bank does is they resell that same ounce over and over under the same terms and eventually you get 50 100 different parties that think they own that same ounce what's eventually going to happen is the opposite of what we saw in crude oil where we came to the delivery month of may crude oil futures and nobody wanted it because there was nowhere to store it and so you had everybody desperate to get out on one side of the trade, but nobody wanting to buy it. There were no bids. And so in a bidless market, the price went all the way down to negative $40, which is just outrageous. What we're expecting one day to happen in gold is the exact opposite. Everybody wants to buy it because it's been so over levered, but nobody's willing to sell it. No one's ever actually it wants to show up and actually have metal that's free and ready to be delivered. And so then you get an offerless uh, market where everybody's bidding and instead of price plummeting you know infinitely really is what crude oil did when it went negative the price of gold goes the other way and that day is coming i mean you just don't want to drive yourself crazy thinking it's going to be like you know next week but that day is inevitably coming i've already driven myself crazy now craig finally speaking of shortages you live in missouri a state where two-thirds of the state's total land acreage is in agriculture your top agricultural commodities include cattle and hogs but as meat processing plants shutter we're seeing shortages consumers your thoughts on this in relation to possible inflation 
And is it, you know, I remember people used to laugh at the Soviet Union, and now we're becoming the Soviet Union. Yeah, that's coming. I, I just can't imagine that we're not entering a period of kind of like 1970s style stagflation, where there's not much economic growth, but they're just printing so much cash that inflation just overwhelms things. You recall maybe, Max, because, you know, you were a young man back in the 70s. Um, that was a pretty good period for gold. You know, gold went from 35 to 800 during the 70s. A uh, really good period for the mining shares, too. So if I'm right, if we're heading into a stagflation type level, you know, type of activity, well, that's going to be another good sign for the precious metals. Well, I still got my gold lame disco pants. I'm hey. ready, baby. Let's yeah. take it to the disco. All right. Well, that's it for this episode of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Craig Hemke of TFMetalsReport.com. If you'd like to get in touch, tweet us at Kaiser Report at my new Twitter handle, Real Max Kaiser. Until next time, bye, y'all.